we've been looking at solving equations that have complex solutions and we've noticed that there are basically two ways to do that. Either your coefficients of your equation can be complex which unsurprisingly leads to complex solutions or alternatively as you see in this case even with just real coefficients in your equation if you have a quadratic or a cubic or anything of a higher order even with just real coefficients you sometimes end up with complex solutions. So that's what we're going to have a look at in this question and by going through the results that are um, being asked for us to prove here we're actually going to uh, come up with one of the really nice theorems within complex numbers. So let's get tucked into this. Consider the quadratic equation uh, az squared plus bz plus c equals zero, where a, b, c are real. So like we were saying before, um, this is one of those cases where all of our coefficients are going to be real. That'll become important later. And b squared minus 4ac, which you might recognize as the discriminant, that discriminant is negative. Now, of course, when you're solving a quadratic equation in the quadratic formula, the discriminant is the thing that sits underneath the square root. So it used to be, before we knew about complex numbers, that if you said that the discriminant was less than zero, we would normally say, oh, you're not going to find any roots. More technically correct, we would say there are no real roots. Because the discriminant is less than zero, but we're allowing for complex solutions, that's why the immediate next sentence says, there are going to be complex roots to this equation. Uh, and what you're going to call this, by the way, that's not a W, it's a, um, a Greek letter you might not have encountered yet. It's a lowercase omega. So we're going to suppose that omega is one of the complex roots of the equation. So then what are they asking us to prove? It says, for part A, explain why A omega squared plus b omega plus c equals zero. All right, so this is not meant to be an arduous question, but you need to think logically about uh, what is the relationship between the roots of an equation and the equation itself. So before we tuck into this particular one, which really isn't gonna be very dramatic, uh, let's just think about an example where we know things a little bit better. Um, if you had, for instance, let's just say consider uh, a quadratic equation that we're pretty familiar with, like say x squared plus 5x plus 6 equals 0. Now you've probably solved this particular equation zillions of times before because it has nice numbers and it's easy to deal with. Um, we could say um, x equals 2, or sorry, x equals negative 2, or x equals negative 3. We could say they are the roots of this equation. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, if we were to say, um, x equals negative 2 is a root, what that means is we could take that value, negative 2, and we could actually substitute it into the equation and it should satisfy the equation. And that's very easy to demonstrate in an example like this. If I take that negative 2 and then square it, I'm going to add 5 lots of negative 2, I'm going to add 6. Uh, let's just go ahead and crunch the numbers on this, right? Negative 2 times negative 2 is 4, uh, 5 lots of negative 2 is minus 10, plus 6, and hopefully it doesn't take too much to convince yourself that that's equal to 0. And we could obviously go through exactly the same exercise for x equals negative 3, because that's also a root. Now, what that means is, if you have a particular value, and it's a root of your particular equation, that's another way of saying that particular value satisfies the equation you started with. Now, in this case, for the question we're interested in, they're calling one of the roots omega. They're just giving it that name, right? They're saying omega is one of the complex roots of this equation. So I can say, here's my actual, here's my part A uh, proof, if you can call it that, right? Since z equals omega is a root, it satisfies the equation. And so, because the equation is uh, a, I should write that down, a z squared plus b z plus c, just squeeze it in, equals zero. What that means is, to satisfy the equation means if we substitute it in, it all works, it's still equal. So I can say a omega squared plus b omega plus c equals zero. I told you it wasn't much of a proof. That's the whole thing, okay? So that's my explanation. It's a root, therefore it satisfies the equation. But how do they want us to use this? Let's have a look at part B together. It says, by taking the conjugate of both sides of the result in A, so this is the result in A, they're asking us to take the conjugate to both sides, and using the properties of conjugates, whatever that means, show that, and then there's, there's this result here. Okay, so let's have a think about this. This is where we want to end up, and uh, where we're going to begin is in the first half of the question. It says, by taking the conjugate of both sides, 
of this result. So let's see what happens when we do that. Um, here is the result from part A. And taking the conjugates of both sides, my notation is this bar that goes over the top, right? So taking the conjugate of both sides is an operation just like differentiating both sides or squaring both sides. We presume that if the two things started off equal, then once you apply this operation to both sides identically, then the result is equal. So, so far so good, not much too dramatic here, but how do I get from this to this? What am I going to do here? Well, this is where um, this suggestion is going to come in, using the properties of conjugates. So there are several properties that I'm going to have to use, and we've looked at these before when we first introduced the idea of conjugates, which is very early on. Before you even knew about the polar form of a complex number or the exponential form, the conjugate of a complex number we define right from the beginning based on rectangular form or Cartesian form, right? If I had you know, some, some complex number z, right? If that was equal to x plus i y, so I've written it in Cartesian form, then we define z bar, the complex conjugate, to be x minus i y. I'll say if that, then this, okay? So what we want to do is use this sort of definition and then some of the properties that come from this definition to get from here to our desired result, okay? So how are we going to do that? There's a few uh, different directions and a few steps we need to go through here. I'm gonna go through them in an order that I hope makes sense to you. The first thing I notice is that I have one big conjugate over here on the left-hand side. And eventually, I'm gonna have like several separate terms that some of which involve conjugates and some of which don't. So what I need to do is take this big single conjugate and break it into several pieces, okay? Now what I have here is the conjugate of a sum of separate things, right? And don't forget, um, omega is a complex root. So omega is a complex number itself. So what I'm doing is, um, when I have these complex numbers in here, I'm taking the conjugate of the sum of those things. What is the conjugate of a sum equal to? Well, we can prove this result fairly, um, fairly simply if we can um, come up with two arbitrary complex numbers and add them together, see what happens when we have a look at the conjugates. So um, I've already defined um, some arbitrary, some general complex number z uh, in this way. Let's, uh, let's introduce a friend like say w, and uh, I need different coefficients here, so let's call it a plus i b. Um, I know I've got an a and a b over here as well, but let's, let's sort of keep this separate to, to prove our results which we're going to use in this particular um, deductive proof. Now if w is a plus i b, then its conjugate w bar is equal to a minus IB. Okay, now what I'm contemplating here is the conjugate of a sum of complex numbers, right? So what happens if I add these two complex numbers, a z and w, and then take the conjugate? Well, let's, let's have a go. Um, z, oopsie daisy, z plus w is just going to be, well, let's have a look. I've just chosen x plus i, y, uh, plus a plus i, b. Uh, there's z there's w, so that's plainly z plus w. In order to work out what the conjugate of this whole thing, this whole, um, this whole sum, right? In order to work out what that conjugate is, I should separate out the real part and the imaginary part so that I can just take the imaginary part and turn it to the opposite sign. If it was minus, I'd make it plus. If it's plus, I'd make it minus. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'll separate out the real bits. That looks like uh, x plus a. Those, part, those parts have no imaginary unit attached to them. And then what I'll do is I'll factorize out an i from everything else because that leaves me with this iy and this ib um, and that makes it very clear if I factorize out i that this entire section here, this is the imaginary part, okay? So there's z plus w, I haven't taken the conjugate yet. Now, if I take the conjugate of the left-hand side, then by definition, the real part remains unchanged like so, and the imaginary part, I flip the sign around. Well, currently it's a plus, I'm gonna change it into a minus, okay? So I get i, y plus b, and like so. So how does this relate to um, the other conjugates that I have up here? Well, hopefully you can see the x and the a are the same, but then I've got the minus ib and the minus iy that come from z bar and w bar, right? I can see that just by expanding. So what I can do is I can say uh, the x plus a, they're just hanging out the front. I'll expand here, iy minus ib. And now if I just kind of collect around the different letters or sort of 
Correct is, collect is the wrong word. I'm just gonna rearrange to put the relevant letters next to each other. X went with Y and A went with B. So you can see what I've got here. If I just put some helpful parentheses here, this is Z bar by definition. There it is right up there. And here is W bar, because you can see um, that's where I wrote it down. So in summary, when I have the conjugate of a sum, that is equivalent to the sum of the conjugates. That's nice and easy to remember, okay? So essentially what I have proved here, this property allows me to take this big conjugate on the left-hand side and break it into pieces. Everything that's added up underneath, I can write it as, a, as its own separate conjugate, okay? So let's have a go at that. In fact, I'm gonna do it in a super lazy way. Uh, I'm gonna take everything, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, look, I can actually um, separate that conjugate and that conjugate, there you go. So on the left hand side, I had um, the conjugate of three separate terms added together and I can say based on this, this property here uh, that this is the sum of these three separate conjugates. Okay, so far so good.